Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. For our viewers who were not with us last week, we want to say to you wonderful people that uh, we dealt with drug courts in Idaho, and the question was, do drug courts uh, involve deterrent for crime? And we certainly concluded it did. We want to continue our conversation with different guests this week in another area of the judiciary in relation to the, that issue. We're going to talk today about the mental health drug courts in the state of Idaho. And I'm so pleased to welcome to the program a, a person who's deeply involved in helping administer this process. Uh, he is an Idaho district judge, John Mitchell, I've known for many years. And Judge, thank you for being here, and we appreciate your time and, and on this very important subject. You're very welcome, Tony. And I'm equally pleased to, to welcome to the program Dusty Davis, who has been in the program. And it's my understanding, Dusty, that uh, the day we're taking this program, that tomorrow you will graduate from the program. And we congratulate you and very proud of uh, your success. Thank you very much. And as always, I'm pleased to have our two regular panelists. The first of all is Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And she happens to be a, a law clerk for one of our district judges. And therefore, it's very appropriate for her to be here, for, as always, but particularly today on this subject. And welcome back, Janelle. And we also welcome our regular panelist, Erna Reinhardt, who is the Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College. And Janelle will commence today's questioning. Welcome to our guests. This is going to be very interesting to learn more about the Mental Health Drug Court. Uh, Judge Mitchell, can you tell us exactly what is the Mental Health Drug Court? Uh, describe it for our viewers. Sure. Yes. We, um, we are an alternative court that uh, meets every week, a specialty court that meets every uh, Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. usually takes about an hour and a half, two hours to, to go through it. We have 26 participants, 25 participants now uh, in our program. They uh, come every week, every Thursday morning. We have a team of anywhere from 10 to about 14 people that meet for an hour before that court. So they're there at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning to start staffing every one of our participants to find out what needs they have and, and uh, what congratulations need to be given out, and if there's any sanctions, what the appropriate sanction would be for any conduct we're trying to change. It's an alternative to going to the state penitentiary is the way it's designed right now. Every single one of our participants, when they started, uh, say for about two maybe, um, so for 23 of these people, it was either come into this program or you're going to the state penitentiary. The problem with going to the state penitentiary is there really is no mental health treatment. You are lucky if you are given your medicines that you should be on. Many of these people didn't even have a current diagnosis of what their mental health problem was. So we treat a felony, felony probationer, that's one of the criteria, with a mental illness, a significant mental illness, and that would either be um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major recurrent depression, one of those three diagnoses. And they also have to have a substance abuse addiction. It's usually an addiction to methamphetamine, but it could be uh, prescription drugs, it could be marijuana, it could even be alcohol. But you need to have those three things, felony, probation, mental illness, and an addiction. And Dusty, what is your role in the program? And I know Tony sort of gave that away before the program, but tell us, what, what, are you, what, were you, what was your role in the program? Well, um, I was offered the program as a second chance, and I just have struggled with being in the system for about 17 years. And um, so I am one of the first five that um, began in the mental health drug court program. And yes, I'm about to graduate tomorrow, so I'm really excited about that. And by the time this program airs, you will be a graduate. Yes. Uh, it'll be very exciting. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. Judge Mitchell, share with us how this program got started and is this something that is unique or are there other programs like this throughout Idaho and throughout the United States? It's uh, not too unique anymore. We started about a year and a half ago. At that time we were only the second one in the state and probably about the 30th nationwide. Judge Moss down in 
uh, Idaho Falls started the first one in Idaho about a year before we did. And we went down and looked at his court and saw the incredible work that they were doing and the, and the great success that they were having with this very difficult population and um, decided let's give it a shot here. And so we started with uh, Dusty and four others and with just with five people and have grown to right around 25. Um, one thing that uh, I think really um, helps us be successful is um, uh, a lot of these people with the, these three mental illnesses that I mentioned, they're all basically a chemical imbalance in the brain. And there's nothing bad about Dusty or anybody else for having that imbalance. It's just the way it is. And with the right medication, you can appropriately treat that imbalance. Well, I think most of these folks are trying to self-medicate by using methamphetamine or using marijuana or whatever it is. You know, if, if you are very depressed and you can't get out of bed, maybe using meth might help you deal with your kids or your job. You know, it's, you're just trying to address the chemical imbalance in your brain and you're not doing a very good job of addressing it. Um, if we can get them off the uh, controlled substance and get them into the right treatment, I think they really appreciate feeling optimum, uh, you know, that they, that they optimally. And that's one thing that most of these folks have never had in, you know, anywhere from the last five years to 25 years. They've never had that feeling of being optimally treated. So Excellent. it's pretty successful. Dusty, I want to share, have you share with our viewers a little bit about the, the the drug court experience, the mental health drug court experience. And last week we heard from Judge Friedlander who talked about that it's really um, a wraparound system that involves a, a team approach that has a lot of different people involved that are there as resources for you. Um, tell Absolutely. our viewers what some of those people are, you know, who, what role they play and what, are, what kind of expertise do they bring to the table and how does that help you? Well, First, I'd like to say that the mental health drug court program has changed my life. And I think a lot of the reasons why it works so well is um, has a lot to do with the structure, the accountability, um, also having a PSR worker, which is a psych psychosocial rehabilitation worker, um, be right alongside you and guide you, um, help you to uh, be accountable. Um, the whole program teaches you how to uh, to um, face your any consequences that you may need to face, um, and it's just the whole structure, and especially the uh, medication, the monitoring of the medication, the supervision, and getting the mental health issue under control, because without that, I think recovery is pretty much impossible. Excellent. Thank you. Judge Mitchell, um, again, there's a lot of experimentation going on in, in the judicial system, uh, and rightly so, to, because what has happened in this country, and it's certainly been the case in Idaho, that the prison populations have been going up, and the budgets of states, Idaho is an example where uh, it's been a challenge on the budget. And in corresponding with you uh, prior to this program, and thank you for that information, uh, as I said last week, uh, you indicated that we have 5,227 offenders in Idaho's prisons uh, and uh, drug or drug-related crimes make up 77 percent of our population. If we can use uh, the court that you're involved with, um, the mental health drug court or the regular drug court or the DUI court and all, not only the most important point of all is, is Dusty is a beautiful example of helping people uh, really save themselves and their lives. As, as a guest last week said, he, it saved his life. That's number one uh, that makes it so worthwhile. But number two, we could really, really attack the problem of crowded prisons and um, the expense, could we not? We certainly could. Um, another thing that you need to realize with that uh, uh, statistic, 77% of the people that are in the state penitentiary are there with an addiction. Of that 77%, 20% of that population has a mental illness. And that's four times more 
five times more, four times more than the normal incidence. The normal incidence in the general population is right around 5%, just a little over. So if you took a uh, cross-section of NIC and the students here, you know, up, if you had 100 students, about a little over five would be suffering from some sort of mental illness. State penitentiary, it's four times more than that. It's right around 20%. I think it's part of the problem there is the trying to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. And so if they went, if, if the mentally ill person went to prison, they're probably not going to have their mental illness treated at all. Sooner or later they're going to get out, they're back into the general population, untreated from a mental health standpoint. They might have had some treatment from a substance abuse standpoint in prison, but did they grasp it if their mental illness was never treated? So it was never very efficient with that population. And, and that also explains part of the repeat rate process problem. That's the main reason why I decided uh, with other volunteers to start this court because in, in the way we assign cases here in Kootenai County in this district is um, if you commit a felony in 2001 then come back and commit another felony and, and, and on the 2001 case I'm your judge. If you commit another one in 2003 I'm still your judge. I'll be your judge 20 years from now if you keep committing felonies. And so I got to know some of our folks pretty well and, and Dusty got to know my predecessor, Judge Judd, pretty well. And then I got to know her pretty well and, and now we've turned that around. I bet, I bet Dusty won't be knowing any other district judges other than socially anymore. So um, it, it, I saw so much uh, recurrence in the drug arena with the mentally ill um, that it, we just figured there's got to be a better way to do this and, and I think we found at least in large part that better way. Not being one that shies away from controversy myself I would ask you a, a more controversial question sure. uh, and I know you wouldn't either. In a number of states around the country we try and crime is a problem and we all obviously want to combat crime we don't want people committing crimes but in many jurisdictions we have uh, Pass laws that says three strikes and you're out. In other words, if someone committed a felony three times, but not, <coughs> none, none of them are violent and it might be theft, whatever. And if the third strike, they're out and they go to prison for the rest of their life, then they cannot be channeled into these kind of programs, can they? Certainly. And we're going to pay about $50,000 a year to house every one of those persons. Not only are you paying 50000 a year to house that person, but you're also not going to save that person and have these successful stories that you're having. Sure. That Dusty's out working. Um, almost everybody that came into our program was unemployed. Most of them were homeless. Those that had kids were losing their rights to their kids, weren't supporting their kids. Almost all of them either have a job or are going to NIC. Um, uh, they've had their rights restored. One of the first things that we do is get them shelter and then they eventually go out and, and are paying for their own shelter. So it's, it's uh, they become a uh, a taxpayer rather than a burden. So if we're going to have a, a continued expanding success of the story, it does also require legislatures around the country to look at some of those laws allowing this program to be uh, more expansive. And, and the Idaho legislature has done some things to help us. Good. They um, funded uh, our coordinator, Suzanne Whitlicky. Her salary now is paid for by the state of Idaho. Um, and the, there's talk of other legislation this session that would help. Um, one of the things that was just in the paper, uh, there's parity now with uh, state employees. So I get, if, if, if I become mentally ill, I will have my uh, care taken care of because I'm a state employee. And that happened, I think, a couple of years ago in the state of Washington on an experimental basis with state employees so they can get their illnesses treated and you know the the hope is that that will be passed on to every employee or you know at least the major employers governmental employers uh, large institutionalized employers would start covering those sorts of things one final question and I have one for Dusty in Idaho like many states and that's great news from the legislature and they should be praised for doing that kind of thing um, but we're having to send now the director of Idaho Corrections, uh, we worked some on some programs together for some lecture series and all, and he had indicated some months ago, which has now happened, that over 300 inmates in Idaho would be sent to Minnesota, and you have to bring them back for 
the expense of trial and different things and send them back. It's millions of dollars involved. So again, with this kind of program, that's another benefit that you, in lessening the number of people in prison, you're less likely to have to do that, uh, sending prisoners to other states. Exactly. Dusty, before the program, you said something that really impressed me, and I'd like for you to share it with our viewers. Our idea is to always help our viewers have more knowledge and understanding, and for you to encourage other people that have had challenges uh, that they might do some things you have to go into the program. Mm -hmm. You said to me before the program that you were so proud that you're going to graduate tomorrow, that you've finished uh, a task you set out to do, and, and if I heard you correctly, you said it is maybe one of the first times in your life that you have finished something. So would you elaborate upon that and share with us uh, and wh how good that uh, is and how much confidence you gather from completing tasks which this structured program has permitted you to do? Yes. Um, for one reason or another, I, I have never been able to uh, complete um, pretty much in anything. And um, this program allowed me to make small successes um, over a period of time that uh, raised my self-esteem and, and helped me to keep plugging forward and until um, ultimately I finally finished this program and it feels really good to um, make such a success. Well, congratulations to you and I would suggest to you that when you have other goals that you seek that now you'll have the confidence to say, I'm going to complete that, I'm going to carry through. Absolutely. Persistence in life is an important thing. Yes. Before I go back to the panel, I'm going to ask our wonderful staff in the control room to put up a website. Uh, our guest last week suggested that, and, and it, it involves all these different kinds of drug courts, uh, and it's got up here on the website now, and uh, for our viewers, if you'd like to get that, um, it is um, up there for you to look at, and you can look at that website, and it'll talk about all the drug courts uh, in Idaho and the mental health courts and the DUI courts and all it might be helpful to you. Even in other states you might want to look at it uh, for ideas for your state. With that we'll return to Janelle Burke. I have a two-pronged question. I'll start with Judge Mitchell. Um, the first part of the question has to do with the interrelationships both personal and uh, perhaps through the system but those relationships that with addiction and how that works, how, how addiction can can determine what people do in all aspects of their lives. Uh, that is the first question. And I think last week we talked some about how it, addiction can influence all of a person's life. And then uh, secondly, who are the members of the team then that you put together? Because you're going to have to treat a lot of different aspects of people's lives. So who are the members of the team that's put together to do that? So the first part uh, first. Well, I think. Um with the extent of addiction that we see, it, it's, it's overwhelming in that person's life. It is, it, it, it's what consumes their life. Um, I can't remember, somebody explained it to me. Imagine that you were having your head held underwater. All you're going to think about is breathing, and that's what it's like to be addicted. Um, and as far as the, the team that helps them get through that addiction and the mental health issue, it's, um, like I said, it's about 14 people. We've got myself, my clerk. Um, we've got uh, Sergeant Stangelin from the jail. And we've got Marcy Black from probation and parole. Then we have, oh, probably at any time at least six psychosocial rehabilitation providers. The mental health experts are there. On many occasions, we've had the psychiatrists. Uh, we have three psychiatrists that we use there. We have um, a uh, public defender that uh, volunteers his time. We couldn't get anybody from the prosecutor's office to volunteer, and so we have a special prosecutor that helps us in that aspect. Um, trying to think who else. We have somebody from uh, Child and Protective Services now, and that's been a, a great addition to our team, you know, helping through those sorts of problems. Um, I know I'm going to be missing somebody. Because many people have family issues that exactly. go right along with this, uh, perhaps with their children or, or perhaps with their families in some respect, husbands and, and, and I, wives. What's really rewarding is this group of 10 to 14 people that assemble every single Thursday morning at a very <laughs> inconvenient <laughs> hour has never varied. There's just no drop off. There's no one that's late. There, I mean, people show up 20 minutes early for this thing. And it's just, they, they're so 
dedicated because they see the success in the people that are participating. It's very rewarding. And Dusty, my question for you is, what was your path to addiction? And at what age did you start to become involved or start to be worried about these things? Well, I think I um, started experiencing symptoms from my mental illness um, in my early teens. And um, I didn't feel like I fit, fit in and I felt different from everyone else. And as soon as I started, began to get involved with drugs and alcohol, then I found that I was fitting in and it also made me feel more normal. And so um, that was the beginning of a lifetime of addictions. When did you realize that you would need dual treatment? Uh, that is treatment for both the addiction and treatment for perhaps mental health, health issues. I have been through um, several other treatment um, programs for uh, drugs and alcohol, um, all of which were unsuccessful. It was, wasn't until, and I wasn't even diagnosed until I was 36 years old. Mm -hmm. So um, shortly after that, um, I became, well, let's see, um, I committed my last crime, which ultimately got me involved in the mental health drug court pr program. And um, that addressing the mental health issues along with the treatment, I think, makes every difference in the world. Thank you. Erna Reinhardt. You stole my question. <laughs> so I don't have a new one. Judge Mitchell, share with us um, the accountability aspect of this program. What is it that the clients or the participants have to go through on a weekly basis to make sure that they're doing their part? And how, how do you make sure that they are accountable? Because I'm sure that there are critics out there that would just say, throw them in jail. Well, and that's a good question. Some people view specialty courts as being uh, soft on crime, and, and I think especially with this population, nothing could be further from the truth. As I said, almost all of our folks were headed to prison. They go to prison, they just sit. That's pretty easy to do, and, you don't, and all your needs are met. In this program, you have four group treatments a week that take anywhere from an hour to a few hours to complete every week. You're in front of me as the judge once a week, every week. You are doing individual uh, treatment as often as uh, necessary. And you still have your, all your other probation uh, obligations, your community service, and everything else. It's very time consumptive. Um, we make people work hard. And, and after a few months, they eventually start looking for work or looking for school. And um, uh, so they are kept extremely busy. Uh, it's not an easy program to go through. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you go to prison. And we've had two that haven't succeeded. So two out of 26, 25 isn't bad for being in existence a year and a half now. Now you mentioned earlier also, Judge Mitchell, that you were a volunteer. So are, is everybody that works in this aspect volunteering their time and resources? Almost everybody does. I don't get any increase in my pay for what I do from 6.30 in the morning till 9 on Thursdays. And it takes about another five hours additionally every week now. For the first nine months, we didn't have a coordinator. So, uh, you know, we tried to piece that together. And I was probably spending almost 20 hours a week trying to get it started. And then once it got started for about the first six to nine months. Now we have a coordinator. A lot of that burden's been lifted from me and from others. But um, uh, for the most part, our public defender, our uh, uh, special prosecutor, um, uh, probation officer, the jailer, they may get their base pay for those hours. I don't know on everyone's end, but I would imagine that they don't. And, um, and there's still a lot of commitment, even like we'll have picnics sometimes. You get everybody there. Everybody on the team is there, and no one's getting paid for that. And, and so that tells me how successful the program is and what high level of commitment we have with our staff. Just Excellent. the things that you know they're not getting compensated for, they're still there. Excellent. Dusty, I, I'm going to have you to do something similar to Joe Miller last week. I am thinking of viewers that might be watching, and some of them may have had some of the challenges you've had. 
and they're not in a program yet. And sometimes when individuals feel isolated or frightened, uh, they're real hesitant to go to a program. Would you be so kind as to share with those that might be listening, encourage them about why they should step forward and, and how it can change their life? Give them some encouragement rather than this anxiety and, and caution they have. Well, um, getting a mental health uh, issue under control is so life-changing, and I'll never forget when I was first got onto medication. Um, it was just amazing to, it's like, wow, so this is <laughs> what it's supposed to feel like to be on a normal, even keel. And as far as um, drug addiction, it slowly consumes your life without you even noticing. And soon, um, the very thing that has you in chains is your best friend. And um, it's a really scary place to be. And um, getting the help is indescribable about how much better it turns your life into. What powerful words, Dusty. I thank you for doing that. In other words, when you are having these, this double challenge and, and you're addicted, you become a prisoner of that, don't you? you you're Absolutely. Not, you're not free. You're not free to make decisions. Um, we're just about out of time, but I would finally ask you, um, the experience of a new world opens up, I would assume that uh, you found a happiness that you never had before. Absolutely. I wish I would have um, been able to get this help much sooner in life. And um, it's definitely opened up new doors, and I'm really looking forward to a bright future now. Wow, what a great way to end the program. And I'm sure that the others that are in the program, you are a support system for one another. You encourage one another, I'm sure. Yes. I want to say one more thing to you, Dusty. When you graduate tomorrow, I will not be there. I will be in <laughs> school teaching. But I'll tell you, I promise you, I'll be thinking about you tomorrow. And we all will be very proud of you tomorrow and, and let you know that we will be thinking uh, and in absence still celebrating your graduation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, we very much enjoyed bringing you this two weeks program. I think they're very powerful and we hope we've helped some of our viewers. And secondly, that we've given some information to states and even to Canada where we go that this is something that can bring uh, new hope to people and, and, and is good for all of society. Uh, until next week, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music